So it's a great honor for me to be presenting our work in front of uh, this uh, FSHD community in Australia. And I, I actually wanted to thank uh, the FSHD Global Organization for inviting me for my first ever stay in Australia and uh, also for inviting me uh, to present uh, our work here, but also for supporting our research. Um, so through my talk today, uh, I actually want to illustrate the benefits of associating competencies, such as those of a developmental biologist like me, uh, to uh, those of uh, clinicians, uh, human geneticists and uh, cell biologists, uh, to make novel progress in the understanding of such a complex disease as uh, facial scapulohumeral dystrophy. And um, I am going to present you, as you may or may not know, uh, the work that we recently did on a novel candidate player in uh, FSHD, the FAT1 gene. So we are all based in France, in uh, Europe, on the, the other side of the globe. And uh, my group is located in Marseille, in the south of France. Um, and we are at the um, Institute of Developmental Biology of Marseille. And I should here say that uh, I was initially not working on FSHD. Uh, the initial goal of my group was to study the development of the neuromuscular circuits, so basically how muscles and neurons are built during embryonic life and how um, alterations of these processes can have consequences that uh, lead to some neuromuscular diseases, but without uh, specifically um, aiming toward understanding of FSHD. And it's somehow by chance that uh, we realized that one mouse model we were working with um, presented some um, striking, striking similarities with FSHD. And that's uh, when we realized this, that it, makes, it made sense to team up with teams uh, of, of clinicians and human geneticists to approach the question of whether the gene we were working with had any relevance uh, to FSHD. So that's uh, when I contacted um, Nicolas Lévy, whose lab is also in uh, Marseille at La Timon, and I initially contacted them because they were uh, a reference center for um, neuromuscular diseases and uh, specifically a reference center for the genotyping of FSHD patients in France. So uh, through them, uh, we would have access to patient material, DNA, and uh, be able to address these questions. And um, so his lab is bigger than this, but these are the people involved in the project. And uh, we later uh, teamed up with uh, the people mentioned by uh, Sylvain before, the group of uh, Gillian Butler-Brown at the Myology Institute in, uh, in Paris. And then these are uh, the people involved in the work. And uh, we are also uh, benefiting from uh, the, the, neuro, um, the, the expertise of the neurologist uh, Robin Fitzsimons uh, here in uh, Sydney. So let me just remind things that uh, most of you know here. So FSHD um, is a myopathy that affects uh, groups of muscles in the face uh, and shoulder area. It actually starts with uh, symptoms such as uh, loss of facial expressions, problems with uh, lifting the arms, and then the so-called scapular winging, as you see on the picture uh, on this uh, left side. And uh, a lot of these symptoms uh, are asymmetric, but also uh, variable. And then uh, later, the, this, the muscle wasting progresses uh, to additional muscles and, and also to the lower limbs, according to a map that is uh, depicted on, on these schemes here, um, and uh, leads, at least in 20% in of the cases, to require a wheelchair. Um, and uh, although we, we've heard about it uh, from Silver, I just would like to remind a few notions about uh, what we know about the genetic causes uh, of FSHD. And um, 
although FSHD is primarily defined uh, by the symptoms, uh, once you are there with the symptoms, then uh, genetic testing uh, recognizes several subtypes or categories, and the most uh, frequent type is FSHD1, uh, which affects about 90% cases, although the numbers here, uh, I'm not a specialist, so the numbers don't really matter. Um, but then there's uh, the other category, FSHD2, which represents about uh, 5% of the cases, and I would also like to mention the other cases, which are cases that were clinically diagnosed as FSHD, but for which uh, genetic, uh, genetic testing failed to recognize either FSHD1 or 2, and for which there is still a lot to be done to understand what they are. And, uh, well, I just want to go quickly uh, to uh, the reasons for them. So as you know, FSHG1 is mostly due to this um, uh, um, genetic abnormality on uh, uh, the tip of chromosome 4. And um, you may know that just at the very tip, the, uh, there, there are these so-called D4Z4 repeats that, that are represented by these triangles. And you know that in um, healthy uh, individuals, there's uh, a lot of these repeats while the primary need to define FSHD1 is a contraction of this area. But as, he, um, as Silver told you, the contraction is not sufficient. And I've represented by this blue dot all the additional requirements that are necessary to define a pathogenic chromosome and to be associated with the symptoms. Um, and FSHD1 have one affected chromosome only, which is sufficient to cause uh, the disease. Now, if we uh, speak about FSHD2, then in, in their case, they have a much more subtle abnormality uh, at chromosome 4, which by itself, so they are not contracted anymore, although they have some of the um, structural abnormalities anyway, but this chromosome on its own is not sufficient to trigger the disease and it needs to be associated with uh, uh, the mutations that Silver described in the SMCHD1 gene uh, mutations that are present on this uh, chromosome 18. Um, and then overall, uh, either a uh, globally affected, um, well, either an FSHD1 chromosome or the, the FSHD2, which is a combination of uh, minor FSHD, uh, minor changes at chromosome 4 plus the SNCHD1, lead to changes at the level of DNA structure, the latter changes leading to expression of this DOX4 uh, protein, which is now considered to be one of the main uh, pathogenic agent uh, causing the disease. Um, but this was what we knew by looking at the DNA. So this is very important, but then where do we go from then? Uh, once we know that DOX4 uh, is expressed, how do we know that this causes symptoms that look like FSHD? Uh, so basically understanding um, how these uh, are translated into FSHD symptoms uh, requires to study mouse models, and as, as uh, you've heard, it is now possible to study these, uh, these models. But there were a few recent studies, um, including la large-scale studies of healthy and FSHD individuals that showed that, first, a, a real pathogenic FSHD chromosome is in fact um, can, uh, rare, but can be found in the healthy population, meaning by itself it's not sufficient uh, to cause the disease. And second, uh, it's also clear now that some healthy individuals express the DOX4 protein, although at low levels. So that means by itself it's not that toxic, toxic since these people have the protein and do not have uh, the disease. So that means DOX4 is necessary, but not sufficient in itself to explain everything about FSHD. 